Lena, did you get a notice that this is recording? Yes. Okay. I got it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Okay, how about about one more minute and then we'll get started. Okay, welcome and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for week eight, the final week of challenge two in our mission, Health Equity Challenge Series. We'll start today's meeting with presentations from Dr. Pamela B. Davis, followed by Dr. David Kelber. Let's give everyone a minute or two more to log on. I think we're good. Okay, welcome again, everyone. If you haven't typed your name in the chat for attendance yet, please do so now. Without further ado, let's meet our first presenter, Dr. Pamela B. Davis, a renowned physician and medical researcher. Dr. Davis became Dean of the School of Medicine and Senior Vice President for Medical Affairs at Case Western Reserve University in 2007, after serving as Interim Dean during the previous year. She served in this position until stepping down in 2020 to serve as a professor in the Center for Community Health Integration. She holds the Arlene H. and Curtis F. Garvin Research Professorship. She previously served as a professor for pediatrics, physiology and biophysics, and a professor of molecular biology and microbiology at the university and as chief of the pediatric pulmonary division at Rainbows Babies and Children's Hospital, and as director of the Willard A. Birnbaum Cystic Fibrosis Research Center at Case Western Reserve University. For more than 30 years, Dean Davis has been continuously funded by the NIH, including serving as the founding principal investigator of the school's $64.6 million Clinical and Translational Science Award from 2007 until 2015, when she began serving as the program's associate professor investigator. In 2021, her research focus shifted to using informatics approaches in large databases to gain insight into important clinical problems. Most recently, the reciprocal interaction of COVID and severe chronic conditions. And she is supported by the NIH for this work in the multiple principal investigator mode. Dr. Davis, you may begin your presentation. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. And let's see if I can. Everybody, uh, everybody vis visible to people? Yes. Okay, good. Um, but that is Dr. Calber. And I need to go back up and move back. Oh dear. Well, stop share. I will get out of my screen. I'll escape and then I will take it back to the beginning. My apologies. We actually did do this in, in advance and it didn't it seemed to work. So let me see if I can fix it. Let me go back and share my screen. Oh dear. Now I'm I'm in real trouble now. Um Tam, do you want me to bring up? I, I mean nope, I could share. share. Let I me could... see. Let me see. I think I got it now. Okay. Share. 
run. Oh, it still says David Calver. I think you just have to go back to the first one. I'm trying. <laughs> okay. Lord knows I'm trying. Here we go. All right, here we go. All right. Yep. So let's get uh, get started. Uh, I the topic today was uh, COVID and health disparities, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the overall health disparities that have been revealed by the uh, COVID epidemic uh, pandemic. And David is going to talk a little bit about how we can address them using the resources that are here. There's no question as the chapter in uh, uh, Lisa Cooper's book indicates that although uh, health disparities have been longstanding and we know that, we, that they are a terrible problem in the United States, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic emphasized and brought this to, uh, to uh, public attention. Uh, there was no question that we, at least weekly and sometimes nightly on the news, there was emphasis that racial and ethnic minorities were disproportionately affected by COVID. They seemed to have a higher incidence of infection. They seemed to have more severe disease and they seemed to have more deaths. Native Americans were affected the most strongly. Blacks and Hispanics were affected more so than whites and Asian Americans seem to be the least uh, affected. And indeed, some of them actually fared better than, uh, than white Americans. Here's some of the data that supports that. This is from the Kaiser Family Foundation. And uh, it indicates that uh, you can see in the first set of bars here that uh, case, the, the, the uh, light blue, is Asian, the gray is white, and the dark is black, the dark blue is uh, Hispanic, uh, is, uh, the, I'm sorry, the dark is American uh, Indian or Alaskan native, the uh, dark blue is black, and the next bar is uh, kind of medium blue is Hispanic. So you can see that there were more cases among uh, American Indians and Alaskan natives, blacks and Hispanics, there were a lot more hospitalizations among those groups, and the deaths were also disproportionate among, uh, among these particular minority groups from, um, uh, uh, from, the, U, uh, from the U.S. This uh, graph goes all the way up to August of 2022 from the Kaiser Family Foundation. So it includes data after the vaccine was available as well as data from the Omicron period. And this is mortality, this is deaths. So here are white Americans, here are Asian Americans, and you can see that the American Indians, Alaska natives top out as the, um, as the really highest, you know, most Im impacted groups, followed by Hispanic Americans, followed by native uh, Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders, followed by blacks and the whites and the Asians have a much less, uh, much less uh, dramatic uh, death rate from COVID, even though we were all affected by this, uh, this problem. So there's no question that there were huge racial disparities here. So why might that be? Um, there have been a number of things that have been suggested to be important in this. It's been suggested that these uh, racial and ethnic groups are more likely to live in crowded and segregated conditions. And that includes incarceration and homelessness. Um, they are also more likely to hold public facing jobs. So they couldn't go home and work from home. They needed to be out there on the front lines. They were bus drivers, they were healthcare workers, uh, they were uh, store, uh, grocery store clerks. They were in other positions where they had a lot of exposure to people in the, in the public. In addition, their basic health had, uh, uh, had a lot to do with this. They were more likely to have predisposing comorbid conditions. And I'll show you a little bit of that. In addition, they had less access to healthcare and preventative care. And they may have come in later, which may have had uh, later in the course of the disease. So that may have had something to do with the necessity for hospitalization and the, the potential for death. 
And as we'll see in a little bit, uh, they were less likely to be vaccinated. And some of this arose from mistrust of the, uh, of the medical establishment. So here are some, uh, just some evidence that uh, particularly black people have a higher uh, uh, pro proportion of comorbidities that predispose to COVID. So you can see here that there are 39% of, of uh, black adults are considered obese com compared to 28% of whites. And the death rate from heart disease, which is another major risk factor for COVID, is significantly higher in the black population than in the white population. Cancer, uh, age-adjusted death rates from cancer are higher in the black population than in the, uh, in the white population. And children tend to be sicker because here's, here's infant mortality and infant mortality is usually defined as death in the first year after, uh, after birth. So there are all these things that come together that make for tremendous um, uh, ethnic and racial disparities. In addition, despite the fact that the vaccine was free and mass vaccination sites were made available, black individuals did not become vaccinated as quickly as whites. Um, suspicion of the medical establishment was certainly one thing, but some people pointed to the notion that uh, initially the vaccines were approved under the emergency use authorization and they didn't receive full approval for uh, at least a year. And I think that many minority, some minority members of the minority populations felt that this was still experimental and had a bad taste in their mouth from being experimented upon and were reluctant to, uh, to take the vaccines. So this graph shows you that very early after the vaccines became available, the Asians hit the target of 70% of the population um, being uh, vaccinated. Um, the second line here are, is the white population. The Hispanics started to catch up to the white population, but at least over the time of this graph, the black population did not. And that presented a significant uh, risk as uh, more contagious variants went on. So you can see here, um, these are uh, hospitalizations for COVID uh, during the different, um, uh, uh, the periods of predominance of, different, of the different variants. In the early part of this graph, this is the Delta predominant period, which ended probably, eh, they're, giving it, they're giving it to you on this graph, December 15th. But you know, I'd say probably it really ended about uh, November 30th when it went down below 90%. And then the Omicron reached over 90% by December 15th. And you can see that unvaccinated people, um, that Omicron surge really hit them and they got hospitalized a great deal. If you had um, not, uh, not completed your, your series, but it started your series, uh, you were much better off than not being vaccinated at all, but you you still had a higher rate of, uh, of a hospitalization than individuals who were fully vaccinated. So vaccination was clearly protective in uh, in all of in uh, in the time of COVID, even for the Delta and Omicron phase. And if you look at what happened with uh, Black individuals in hospitalization. Uh, the white individuals, non-Hispanics, had a curve a lot like the vaccinated curve, a little bit up there, because certainly not all white individuals were vaccinated, but the black individuals had a, a peak of, ho of hospitalization when the uh, in highly infectious uh, Omicron phase uh, surged. So not getting vaccinated was a significant, all, also a significant risk factor for the minority population. So what happens with, um, uh, with what are the, the, the determinants of uh, a vaccine uh, uptake or not? Um, I don't know if you have your, your line on the side like I do, uh, you may not be able to see the flu vaccination, but this is comparing uh, the rate of flu vaccination with COVID vaccination. So if you had higher median uh, uh, income, 
you were more likely to be vaccinated or lower median income, you were less likely to be vaccinated. Um, they both sort of hit the zero line, you know, both the flu vaccination and the COVID-19. So that isn't a, a big deal. So the big differences here are there are very few uh, differences for the flu vaccine. There's very little um, uh, you know, uh, risk in your uh, urban versus rural. There's very little uh, risk in, uh, in uh, the high school graduation rate, excess risk, rate of vehicle ownership. Political ideology is in there. So there are certain people who do not believe in vaccines and they don't take flu vaccine but a lot more people who do not believe in COVID vaccine uh, and um, in the vaccination for COVID. And that was, is, a, is a big problem. Oop. And, oop, come on. And, uh, but the proportion of black residents is not an issue for flu vaccination, but in communities where there's a high proportion of black residents, there's a lower COVID vaccination rate. By late 2021, non-white races and ethnicities were beginning to catch up to whites with respect to, uh, to vaccination. And honestly, at that point, political uh, objectors uh, became the dominant non-vaccinated group. And I believe now are the dominant uh, non-vaccinated group. And this is from uh, MMWR, the Mor Morbidity and Mortality uh, Weekly Report from the CDC in 2022. This resulted in uh, Hispanics and Blacks, I've outlined the Blacks here, catching up with the, with the whites. You can see the Asian uh, Americans are well above the whites. Hispanic uh, individuals caught up with the whites by October of 2022. Blacks are catching up by October or, uh, and, uh, uh, Native Hawaiians, other Pacific Islanders are nearly there. American Indian or Alaskan Natives are still not up there. And people who report multiple racial backgrounds are, uh, are also um, not, uh, not catching up with respect to vaccination. So this is, a pro this is a problem because it's clearly protective and helpful. Uh, to be vaccinated, and these things do uh, do did originally fall out along racial lines, but they've started to um, you know for uh, blacks and Hispanics they've started to converge. So what do we do in our research? Um, thanks to David's participation in the Trinetics database of a uh, uh, Trinetics is a co corporation that has collected from about 74 uh, health systems, 110 million electronic health records. And we access through the Metro, uh, Metro portal to examine the reciprocal impact of COVID on chronic diseases such as dementia, substance abuse, type one diabetes, uh, elevated liver functions, a whole raft of, of chronic in, uh, uh, illnesses. This database contains information on self-reported race ethnicity. So you had to tell the doctor uh, to put it in your uh, electronic health record. And if you decline to say, it's not reported. However, there's less extensive information on the social determinants of health. And I think David may have a solution for that. Our data that we've looked at agree in general with the disparities report. In our data among vaccinated, although we have tremendous racial disparities in the initial infection and hospitalization with COVID, once we look at vaccinated individuals, the racial disparities with respect to COVID are much less or even absent. So I would say that the racial ethnic disparities have played a big role in the severity of a COVID pandemic, and they have highlighted pre-existing disparities. Vaccinations are protective for both blacks and whites, for everybody, but there was a, initially less uptake among minorities and that did cost the minority community in terms of hospitalization and death. And the focus on COVID has brought health disparities into sharp focus for the American public and for American medicine. So I think that this is a, a, an object lesson and, a land, and will be a landmark 
for uh, the, the uh, American medicine and public health addressing health disparities. So the second part of this presentation is from David Calvert. Okay, uh, if you guys have any questions for Dr. Davis, please type them in the chat and we'll address them in our question and answer uh, portion shortly. Now, let's meet Dr. Calvert. Dr. Kelber is a professor of internal medicine and pediatrics, co-director of the Center for Education and Training in Health Informatics in the School of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University, and Chief Medical Inform, I'm sorry, and Chief Medical Information Officer, Metro Health System. Dr. Kelber has published over 175 abstracts and manuscripts. His primary area of informatics research includes electronic health records to study and improve health personal health records, health information exchange, telehealth, and big data, as well as clinical informatics education. Dr. Kelber, the, the virtual floor is yours. You're on. Can people, people hear me okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to, to dialogue with folks here, and I think, Hopefully, uh, I'll get a little bit more into some of the, the details of what we're doing, but I thought uh, uh, Dr. Davis's introduction was very, um, you know, very helpful in setting the stage for this. So to me, uh, again, you know, I'm, I'm, I look at things, maybe sometimes my blinders from an informatics perspective, but really thinking about COVID-19 and health disparities from a big data perspective. So um, I want to just review some of the tools that the CTSC supports from a big data perspective. And again, thinking about not only COVID, but how anybody here, and please tell your friends, you know, how you could use these tools as well, and then review some of the, the, the information that we've actually looked at using these tools with COVID-19 and health disparities. So the first one, um, and, and Pam already mentioned briefly, is uh, Trinetics. Uh, so again, I'll just try to go through these at a pretty high level and then happy to go into more in the question and answer if people have more questions. So this is a, um, it's a commercial EHR data aggregation company. Excuse me, been around for several years now. The panel on the left just gives you some sense of the different data sets that Trinetics has with both the um, number of systems participating. So you can see like in the upper left, 78 out of 80. So that's 80 healthcare systems uh, potential. And then it gives you the number of patients. So, you know, many of these have, you know, over um, 100 million patients worth of data. There was a special COVID-19 research network. There's the data from European countries, Latin American companies, Pacific Asia um, countries as well. Uh, a lot of stuff from the US. Uh, you can see the Metro Health data is there. One of the very nice things, just from a usability perspective, with uh, Trinetics, for example, is just software as a service. So, um, literally, as Pam knows, I think she called me up one day, probably a year ago, and said, "Hey, I heard about this Trinetics thing. Can you get me access?" And literally, within about you know a minute or two, <laughs> I could just go into the system, give her access, and she could get a, an email about. It. So it's, it's pretty easy to to access. All you have to do is a computer with internet. Uh, it does have, I would say, some really good uh, self-help tutorials. And then the other very interesting thing that I'm showing here in the middle is it has built-in analytics features, which to me is a game changer for certain types of researchers, because particularly as I'm working with residents, medical students, even junior faculty, they may have great ideas and a little bit of time. Sometimes they don't have the analytical skills themselves and to try to find a statistician or others to, to help them can be a challenge. But in, in this tool, Trinetics, it's, it's built in the analytics feature. So you need to know a little bit about statistics and analytics and able to use that, but you don't actually have to do the programming for that because it's built into the tool. On the right-hand side of the slide, uh, again, this is just a smattering now of, I would say, probably close to 40 publications that um, you know, I've worked with Pam and uh, Dr. Rong Zhou. Um, I've worked with a number of medical students. We've just so many publications. I think we've got about 30 this year so far. Um, it's just, it's so easy to, to do these sort of things. Um, and I sort of put, put some of that uh, down below. There is no IRB needed to use these tools. Why? Because it's all population level the identified data. So literally from an IRB perspective, this is not considered human subjects uh, research. 
Uh, I mentioned the publications there. And again, I think it's, it's great for lots of people, but particularly for trainees and early career researchers to produce scholarly activity. And again, it's one of those things where once you get set up, it's probably a couple hours to learn how to use it. And then the results, when you type them in, you know, you get them back in, in seconds. And so it's, it's very exciting, I think, for people to basically say, hey, if you spend an evening or two, you can start to get some results from this. So sort of very low uh, barrier to entry. Uh, this is another tool we spent a bunch of time on, um, and I'll, I'll give some studies of this or examples of this one too, but this one's called Cosmos. So it's an epic EHR customers creating the largest uh, data set ever. Um, it is all with the uh, Epic Corporation. You have to have the Epic electronic health record, which is, is a limitation on some level, but the Epic Corporation uh, is very prolific in the US. It's estimated that it's close to three quarters of patients um, have information in an Epic electronic health record. And I'll get to this in a couple other slides, but the advantage of data all from the same vendor's electronic health record is you know the data model is exactly the same across the country and you can build things into that data model for example social determinants of health questions <laughs> um, that might not be in electronic health records uh, elsewhere so this just gives you a sense and i'd say one of the things that's very interesting with the pandemic is people are much more willing to share data during a public health emergency and so we saw both trinetics and uh, explorers greatly greatly increase in terms of the willingness of people to share, put their electronic health record data in it. Um, so when I was preparing for this presentation, we're now just past 170 million patients. Um, on the right-hand side here is some of the data models. The one I'll just point you to here is the, the lower right-hand corner, the patients with birth parent information. So this is a huge gold mine. So you know, one of the challenges, particularly for pediatricians or maternal fetal medicine, doctors is you really want, you think, and you have really good reasons to think this, that what's happening with the, the mother, uh, you know, in most cases is affecting the child. But if you don't have a very good data linkage between mother's data and child's data, your ability to actually pursue any of the great hypotheses you might have is, is very limited. So again, to my knowledge, to have 5 million parent baby dyads um, I mean, it's just, it's an unheard of resource that's never been available before. Um, there's the website if people want to just learn more at a high level, cosmos.epic.com. And, um, you know, you can see a little bit there. And to dig into what we're talking about here, I'll show on, on some of the next slides. So it now includes Epic Social Determinant of Health Wheel, which is basically, it's about, you know, 25 to 30 structured um, question and responses around social determinants of health that are now being collected and put into this. And then the other thing that Cosmos does is it, in, because we know where the patient lives, it imputes social vulnerability index data for patients as well. So it's not the patient reporting the data, it's imputed from things like uh, census data, which is not, you know, in the absence of no data, imputed data can be great, um, obviously, it'd be really nice to have the specific data on patients, but that's what you're getting with the, the SDOH uh, wheel, which I'll talk about. Um, and then both Trinetics and Cosmos do have the concept of line level data. And again, if anybody's interested, I can talk more about that. You know, line level data, you can do a little bit more things with that. Of course, the challenge is you have to have much more sophisticated analytical um, capabilities and, and experience to leverage that well. So I'll just go through a couple of studies and then I'll end with the, some of the SDOH and, and social vulnerability imputed values. So this is a study that uh, we published in 2021, sort of within about one year of the pandemic. And this is very interesting. So we're looking at racial disparities in asthma ED presentation. So, so the idea is, you know, how pe for people with asthma, what percent of the time are they presenting to the ED with an asthma uh, exacerbation? And what was interesting here is that actual overall ED visits for asthma exacerbations decreased. And this was an example where actually the disparities decreased as well. And so you might think, well, why is that? So, so the way we thought about it, well, that's because um, everybody was doing, think about what was happening in you know, the, the, from March, 2020 through Q1 of 2021, everybody was masking, social distancing, hand washing very, very well. And so not only did that help with COVID, 
but that helped with a lot of other diseases that might cause asthma exacerbation. So you could think RSV, influenza, um, you know, para-influenza, all the sorts of viruses that were out there. And then again, to me, the way I think about this, and again, I don't have data, this is just the way we framed it in the discussion, if people want to read it, is, is that there may be social economic factors. So for instance, possibly people living closer together or other things that would exacerbate racial disparities in ED asthma related admissions. But then those mitigating factors we were doing, the masking, the social distancing and the hand washing, they mitigated the impact of some of those other social determinants or socioeconomic issues on asthma exacerbation. So again, I, you know, I don't want to overplay it, but I'd say if there's one little silver lining you know, in COVID here, that, that these things uh, actually decreased racial disparities, not in COVID, but in this case in asthma-related uh, ED visits. Uh, and then this was another one uh, we we're just preparing now. This one uh, is actually using um, uh, Cosmos. Um, so, you know, as, as people know, there was, um, you know, antiviral medication uh, that came out for uh, COVID um, basically earlier this year. And these, all of these tools, both Trinetics and Cosmos, are basically real time. So within a couple of days, you know, data starts flowing into these. So basically the question we were asking is, okay, now there are these new antiretrovirals um, that are approved by the FDA and should be used in lots of people when they, when they have COVID. And so is the prescribing, are there disparities in prescribing? And, you know, basically I try to highlight the, the, uh, the important part in red there to make it obvious. So basically what you're seeing is yes, there are disparities. So you can see there, um, you know, of all patients, if you're white uh, or and non-Hispanic, then you had about a 0.2% chance of being prescribed one of these medicines. But if you were black or Hispanic, um, you know, you had less than 50% of chance of getting it compared to your white non-Hispanic colleagues. And then same thing for the high risk people, um, high risk for severe COVID. Similarly, you know, if you're a white non-Hispanic, you were about twice as likely to be prescribed one of these medicines um, than, if you, than if you weren't. So again, that's sort of a double whammy, right? Because as, as Pam showed and we know, the, these, the, the black and Hispanic Latino, they're more likely to get COVID to start with um, and then they're less likely to prescribe the medicine that would help. Uh, so I just want to end, I think I have just a couple more slides here. Um, now, how can we leverage these tools that I would say at Case, we're one of the few institutions that, you know, has the tools, knows how to use them, and is interested in this. How can we start to think about marrying social determinants of health data uh, with other electronic health record data. So here what I'm showing is the social determinants of health data being automatically imputed on all patients in Cosmos based on patient uh, address geocoding. Uh, so again, we know where everybody's living, so we can geocode that and link that, say, with census tract data. And so literally every patient, we have things like, um, you know, what's the, based on the geography, you know, are they living below poverty? Um, you know, you can think about disability, unemployment, uh, the overall social vulnerability index, which is a sort of a standard thing to look at social vulnerability. So again, we have this data now on like 170 million people in conjunction with all of the rest of their health data. So, you know, the diabetes, the blood pressure, the COVID, you know, everything else. Um, so it's all there. Uh, now it just has, somebody has to be asking the right questions and, and answering them through these tools. Um, then we also have a number of self-reported social determinants of health data included in the Cosmos on millions of patients. So again, that gets back to what I was framing as the SDOH wheel. So I would say that over the last, say, three to four years, many, many Epic Electronic Health Record customers um, have been implementing this and starting to collect all this data on their patients. So I'll just say at Metro, we just are about to pass our 100,000th patient where we've asked all these questions basically at least once. Um, and so you can just see them there, huge diversity of questions in the social determinants of health space. Um, all of these have uh, questions that have structured data responses. So it's easy to um, you know, grade the responses, so to speak, and then do analysis based on those responses. So again, you know, as a physician, we were collecting information about alcohol, uh, you know, sort of forever, hopefully. But you know, I would say until a couple of years ago, I was never asking about food security. Um, 
you know, social connectedness, uh, stress. Again, it just wasn't in my normal lexicon, you know, things I should be uh, asking about. Well, now we're starting to collect all that, that information. Again, you can see all the different categories uh, up there. Uh, this is just one example to give you a sense of what this looks like. Um, and also to show that, you know, we're doing a bunch of things, but haven't gotten there yet. So, you know, as the teaser, I say, imagine SDOH data fully integrated with health data on millions of patients to investigate disparities in health. So it does exist today in Cosmos, but what does that look like? So here I just picked one of those variables, uh, number of patients by physical activity days per week. Um, and so first of all, you can see the big yellow bar. So, you know, most patients, 137 million, no, no data, right? That's because again, of all those patients, you know, they just haven't been asked those questions. So it's not being pumped into Cosmos, but look at that. We've got almost a million people that said zero days a week, you know, 400,000, three days, uh, 269 or 96,000. So you can just see. So literally, if you look at the non yellow bar, we've got a couple million people that are uh, self-evaluating what their physical activity days of the week are. And then again, it would be pretty easy for those people that we have data on to correlate, you know, what does that have to do with BMI? What about COVID? <laughs> you know, what about other things? And again, I would just say, we, uh, you know, I have never seen discrete data like this that now starts to be on millions and millions of people. And what's going to happen over the next, say, you know, three, five, seven, 10 years, it's just going to get more and more, you know, the data is going to become richer and richer. So eventually, you know, this yellow bar will get really, really low. And all these other bars will get higher and higher and higher as we as we routinize the collection of this data in in healthcare systems. So, in summary, uh, large aggregated electronic health record data sets with web-based user interfaces like Trinetics and Cosmos can literally transform, from my perspective, and I've been doing this for over a decade now, certain types of clinical research, including. Uh, you know, a number of COVID-19 studies, uh, as we've shown. Uh, these tools are increasingly including either imputed or self-reported social determinants of health and other disparities data. Um, so again, it used to be the idea is it was very hard to do anything in this space because the first thing you had to tackle was data collection. Um, a lot of that, there's still more work to be done, but a lot of that is already being done, as I just alluded to. So how do we take advantage of it? And, and again, I would say, we're in this first mover phase where researchers at CWRU, I think, maybe I'm biased, but I think are uniquely poised to leverage these tools to study COVID-19 and other diseases because of access. You know, we have the tools, we have expertise in the tools, and I think this is something at least a number of us are very interested in pursuing. So my own little commercial at the end, you know, if you want to learn more about these tools or, or how to have access to them, um, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kelber. Uh, let's see if we have some questions in the chat. I know we do have uh, one from Josephine. Josephine, would you like to read your question? Um, if I can, uh, yeah, it was just, I, I just wanted to know how to, to access the Trinetics. Is that it? Trinetics, yeah. So I'd say that the simple answer, um, you know, just send me an email and, you know, we'll probably set up a quick meeting. And I just want to, you know, one of the things I do is, um, I mean, I don't want to oversell it. So usually what I do is I want to talk to people about what they're trying to do just to make sure it seems like the tool is going to be the right tool. Um, and then again, to me, part of this is also about partnership. Um, so, you know, not only do I want to make sure that you have a good, that, that your question, um, you know, has a good chance of being answered, but then I'd really, I and other people on my team would really like to partner with you, um, in terms of, you know, answering that question, because, you know, there is an expertise and a learning curve to using big data and interpreting the results of, of big data and sort of framing that. So we're not sort of over promising or under promising, you know, what the results of that are. But anyway, so the short answer is if you just send me an email at one of those email addresses, we'll set up a meeting and we'll go from there. Well, the other thing I would say about this is that uh, David and his team at Metro have spent a lot of time contributing data to these databases. And also, um, actually, David himself has worked with both Epic and the Trinetics people to improve the databases. So this did not just spring fully formed like Athena out of the head of Zeus. This came at the, you know, with blood, sweat, and tears. 
at Metro and Metro need, uh, needs to be sure, we need to be sure if we're gonna use that, that we acknowledge Metro and we make sure that Metro gets proper credit for making this available to people because uh, it, is, uh, it, is a, uh, it is a gold mine um, and it's important to know how to, um, how to uh, uh, you utilize it the best but it's also important to know that there are some real bona fide experts over at Metro who can help you with, uh, with those questions. I had a question. Um, I did put a little blurb in the chat, but it's about Doc Opera, but it has to do with EHR. <laughs> so you might wanna read that. Um, they were talking about inviting you to come dance with us, David. Um, it's next Saturday. Um, no, I was going to ask David about uh, the imputation of the social determinants of health data. How, how likely it, is it that if you impute the data based entirely on their zip codes, that it's incorrect? Has anyone looked at that? Well, again, just as a very simple, I mean, I, I, I don't know if people have looked at that specifically, probably somebody has. And again, I would say it depends, right? It depends on the heterogeneity really of that census block. How does a particular person in the block, because I mean, the, the data for the imputation is fine, right? What I mean by that is so, so the Census Bureau, they know very clearly what the average value for that census block is. But for, I mean, again, you know, we're all sort of, we've, we've done some data things, right? So for a particular person, the average might match perfectly or the average may be terrible, <laughs> right? And the problem is for a particular person, you don't really have any idea unless you know something specific about that person. But the problem with this data set is that, you know, to make it de-identified, you know, by the, by the time you're looking at it, you don't know anything about the person. So, so all I would say is, is it depends, right? I think, and again, this is where I sort of frame it. I mean, to me, the ultimate is you want to have that SDOH wheel filled out on everybody, right? And, and even updated like once a year, I don't know, on everybody. Um, we're probably many years away from that. Um, but in the alternative, what, what else do you have? What, what you have otherwise is sort of nothing. So I, so I think it's the imputation is much better than the alternative of nothing. <laughs> um, uh, you know, but it's not as good as hopefully once we'll get it on everybody. So, I mean, it's sort of a, I mean, I'm trying to be responsive. I, so I guess I would just say, I think we have to be careful. I think it will allow us to have insights that we were never able to make before, but we have to recognize and be upfront with it, that it is an imputation. So, you know, it's open to error, not because the underlying data is wrong, but because a methodology of imputation leads to some inaccurate or could lead to some inaccuracies. Thanks. Is this by census tract or what? They they basically do it by census tract, right? So it's pretty, I and mean, again, that's the other thing, you know, how how big or how representative is a census tract? Well, in an urban area, it's really small, right? So probably more likely to be representative. Again, I mean, I'm not an expert on this. You know, probably in, in rural areas or less populated areas, maybe the imputation, I mean, it's still an average, but maybe there's more heterogeneity within the, the census block, literally just because the census block is a lot bigger. But the best you can get from Trinetics is zip code, right? And you can't get zip code if there are fewer than 80,000 people in the zip code. So this is a really real step up from what you could do in, uh, in terms of social determinants with Trinetics. I just wanted to follow with a comment because I think Pam and David, both these, both these talks are extremely timely because um, I am teaching a part of the section of the collaborative practice class with all the health professions education on the history of Cleveland and the structural competencies, meaning the, all the structural factors in Cleveland that relate to health disparities and things in Cleveland. And um, we, we did an exercise yesterday where um, the students were to identify factors from an actual clinical, several clinical cases, um, factors and potential interventions. And one, one of those levels of structural competency is the research level. And the students had 
I mean, they, they just said, oh, I think we need to do more research in health disparities. And um, so now I have three more sections of that class. So I'm gonna specifically point out, go to David Kelber, start working on Trinetics. I think a lot of them have a requirement for a research project anyway, as part of their, so um, I will definitely be pointing them in your direction. Um, but it's also really timely because they were sort of vague on what can be done. And you gave some terrific examples of what can be done. Well, I would point well, out that David has several medical students working with him right now. And uh, between Rong, Zhu, and me, uh, we have seven. Excellent. So, oh, I'll point them to you too, Pam. <laughs> so, you know, uh, we have one from the CCLCM. And we have six from the university program right now at all at all levels. And uh, David, I, I, I last time I talked to you, you had four, but I, you know, I, I don't know whether that's still an accurate representation. But yeah, these are nice um, strategies for uh, uh, for medical student research because you can ask a circumscribed question and get an answer. Now you may not get away with it. Um, you may not get away with it, uh, uh, you know, with uh, the paper because it may come back and they may want other stuff, you know, as uh, reviewers are want to do. But yeah, we've David has been great in getting uh, medical students working on this. The the other thing yeah. we would love to have for this class, even in the future, is um, clinical cases relating to um, sort of health disparities in Cleveland that relate to Cleveland's history. So we have one about lead poisoning. We have one about cardiovascular disease. We have one about infant mortality. Those are sort of the biggies in Cleveland. But if you have any cases like that, this, the cardiovascular case actually isn't from Cleveland, it's from Baltimore. Uh, we would love a local case. So um, be thinking of that for, for the students because this is all health professions as students, not just, not just MDs. I see. Okay. Yeah, I'll just put in a quick plug too. Actually, a couple of the students I was working with, they actually, they've created a Trinetics users group within the School of Medicine. Awesome. Um, so far, I think they've had two meetings, but to me, that's, that's actually like self-help, right? So it's, it's a bunch of students are so interested, but they know other students can, can sort of, you know, that group think idea. That's terrific. Okay, do we have any more questions for Dr. Davis and Dr. Kelber? I have a question, this is outside of just the data. Hi, Dr. Kelber and um, Dr. Davis. So my question is, so right now we're in the I guess they say endemic, we're pretty much the same as here, but not here at the same time. Um, with the um, booster, do you feel, because right now it seems on both ends, well, not on both ends, it seems like the last stat that I seen was like one out of five people that previously had um, the vaccines are going to go get the booster. So do you feel as though we will see any type of either it's racial, economic, or any type of difference between that when it comes to the booster? And, and, and with that, do you, yeah, do you feel like data will show that or would that even be, I don't even know if that's something that people are looking into now because of how much less light the vaccinations have been receiving now. Do you feel like there will be any racial economic differences between the two? Between either getting the um, booster and not getting boost, this latest booster that just came. Well, I, you know, I'll start and let David uh, f finish up. Um, I think now that the, um, uh, the vaccines are approved, I think that there we've removed one barrier to people's thinking about getting the vaccines, number mm -hmm. one. One of the things that uh, that would call cause people to hesitate might be um, uh, cost. And up until now, there has not been a cost with the boosters, but I understand the government is thinking about uh, 
withdrawing the heavy subsidy and it might be more expensive you know, to get a booster. And that will, of course, be an issue. It is my mm -hmm. guess that, that, that uh, Medicaid and Medicare will, uh, will continue to provide those and that many insurance companies will continue to provide those uh, at no cost to the patient because, uh, frankly, the data are pretty good that you don't go to the hospital as much and a hospitalization costs a lot more than even a hundred dollar booster. So, you know, uh, so I, I, I think that the barriers are removed, but in some ways I've been in medicine for 40 years and I've given up trying to predict human behavior. David? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I, I don't think I have a lot to add. I guess I would just say, you know, we know that there are disparities in who, who got vaccinated, you know, even initially for all sorts of reasons, you know, you know, we don't need to go into all those. And so I would assume that there's going to be, um, you know, diversity issues in, in who's getting, continuing to get the boosters. Um, and again, I, I would just say, and I, you know, um, yeah, I don't know how much time we'll have. To me, that that's a sort of question that with these tools, we can ask and answer very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I don't know if we'll be able to stay on for one, but just when you ask the question, I'd say I'm already 20% done with answering that question using the slicer dicer tool at, at Metro. And it basically, all I'm going to do is say, who is fully vaccinated at this point? And then are there any, I mean, I'll just, just, just for the sake of time, maybe I'll just pick race. Um, and so we'll see if, well, if, if, if people want to stay on, or if there's more questions, we'll see if I can show you a screenshot of that, you know, before one o'clock here. And again, the reason to do this is just to say that this is the power, right? So you have a question that seems like a very reasonable question. I would say none of us on right now, none of us on this call know the answer to that question. I hope to be able to give you an inkling of the answer to that question within the next seven minutes. We'll see if I can do it. <laughs> Go, David. <laughs> The timer's clicking. The timer's clicking, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Share your screen. We want to see what you're doing. Oh, okay. We can do that here. Let me do the screen share here. Um, share the screen. Yeah, get out, know how to do it. Get out your know. magnifier. So if he's going to share his screen. <laughs> yeah, let me see. Okay, can people see my screen okay? Yes. So just to give, give you some idea, so I'm in our Epic uh, electronic health record here at Metro. So again, to me, I'm just looking at Metro data because that's the stuff I can look at you know, most, most quickly. And again, particularly if we're thinking of Cleveland, you know, there's a lot of Metro. So, so basically what I'm showing here is um, you know, all the people in Cleveland at, you know, at Metro that are fully vaccinated. Um, and actually, oops, sorry, the picture's in the way. And let me see here. Um, actually, let me do this a slightly different way. So we have like 1.5 million patients at Metro. Uh, so again, you could just see there of like, you know, the 200 or so thousand, you know, it's a, you know, it's a pretty small amount that we're fully vaccinated, but that's not totally fair because, you know, there, there might be a patient that just comes to our emergency department, for example, um, you know, for whatever reason. And so do we really expect that we would know about all that immunization issue that we would vaccinate them? You know, maybe not. So we have this thing called the um, wellness registry. So the concept of a wellness registry, those are people that we would consider to be quote unquote, you know, our patients. Um, so let me see here. So of those patients, um, so that's about, you know, 450,000. So now let's look at immunization and we'll look at fully vaccinated for COVID-19. <clears throat> um, and so here, you can, again, you can just see, so we're already getting close, I think, right? So you can see basically wow. of all the, now I just did adults, but I could easily change this to kids as well. So basically just over 50%, we could convert this to percentages, but you can see the blue is, um, you know, uh, a little bit higher than the than the red or the pink. Um, so now let's see. Let's put in a slice for. We said um, yeah, where are we here? So patient demographics, and so let's just pick um, race. Um, and so now we can grab the top ten. Hopefully this will be pretty quick. So again, this this will give us an inkling of that answer. 
what it will do, it'll create lots of little pictures. So it might be a little bit hard to see. <laughs> um, and we could just, you know, we could just choose to just do, um, okay, so let's just so to get rid of some of these to make it a little easier to look at, let's just focus on white versus black. But you can see, I mean, all the data is here, just so you can see it's a little easier to see over the screen. Um, so again, to me, you're already seeing, so, you know, there's a lot fewer blacks that are immunized, right, relatively speaking, than the white. So again, I would just say, you know, with, I don't know how much more time I have, but it's getting close to the top of the hour. Okay, so like in five minutes, um, I started to answer your question, right? So I would say, um, you know, we're already seeing a continued disparity. Now, again, this would be built upon the idea that probably, you know, there were fewer blacks that started the series, so they're less likely to complete, but it's, we're just exacerbating this. So that, again, you can just look at this data at a high level here. There are many more whites, right? So significantly, it looks to me like probably two thirds of whites have completed the series where you can see it's only about, again, you can do the math, they're only about one third of black or African-American have completed that. So, but anyway, to me, hopefully the real power of this was the fact that you could ask a question that I had never thought about before, you know, and within, you know, five minutes, I'm not saying I fully answered it. And again, you and I can meet more and, and go after that. Um, but again, within a couple of minutes, I get it. You, I can help answer your question to a question that I'd never heard until you, um, you know, asked it a couple of minutes ago. I just had a quick follow-up question, um, just based off of that. With UH um, switching over to EPIC, do you see opportunities to work together to really like compile a, a bigger picture of, you know, something like what you just looked up? Um, you know, knowing that like the hospital demographics can be slightly different or, or majorly different, I'm not sure, but do you see opportunities in the future to collab once UH makes that switch to EPIC? So I would say absolutely. <laughs> um, now, let me just expand on that briefly. I know Pam has played a lot in this space as well. So from a technology side, this is going to be a huge game changer, right? Because the whole point is now, but the UH, Cleveland Clinic, and Metro will all have the same electronic health record with the same underlying data model. So the ability to share data for clinical purposes will be much, much greater. And the ability to share and combine data from a technical perspective will be much, much easier and better as well. Um, but, and then, so that's all the, the, the pro side, but again, to me, you know, I've been in this town long enough and in Fox long enough, you know, data sharing and collaboration is say 10 or 20% about the technology and 80 or 90% about the non-technology things, right? So there has to be the commitment to want to share all that amazing data that would be commingled. And obviously this is something the CTSC for the last decade or more, you know, has been trying to tackle and we've made significant progress. But I guess what I'm pointing out is that certainly UH going to Epic from a technical perspective will help us a bunch, but I think the much more, um, you know, the, the, the road that is gonna be more difficult to travel, but we're traveling along it is to work on all the non-technical things for us to share more. Thank you. Okay, thank you again, Dr. Uh, Davids and Carable. Uh, we're grateful that all of you decided to join us for week eight, the final week of challenge two in our mission, Health Equity Challenge Series. You'll receive a survey regarding this challenge in the coming days. We look forward to seeing you at future programs and sincerely appreciate your commitment to advancing health equity. Everyone have a great weekend, or I'm sorry, a great week. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.